From Real Ghost Stories Online, welcome to another episode of our little radio program. I am Tony Bruski, along with Jenny Bruski. Thank you so much for joining us. Please remember to subscribe to the show wherever you may be listening to it, whether it be iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, press the subscribe button. That helps us very much. And you don't miss any episodes of our show. Of course, you're always welcome to share your ghost story with us. Just go to our website at Real Ghost Stories Online. Click on the Tell Us Your Ghost Story button and share that show with us. And, of course, share the show with your friends. And, of course, let us know if you shared the show. I have a bonus episode to give you. You just email me a screenshot of where you shared the show. Just email Tony, T-O-N-Y, at realghoststoriesonline.com. And I will send you that uh, Real Ghost Story bonus episode. So, um, being the uh, semi, I guess, morbid people that we are, um, or I am anyway, um, it, it's our anniversary weekend, me and, and, and Jenny Bruski over here. And uh, we were talking about what should we do for our anniversary? And, and the show, as you may know, is, is taped in the middle of the United States. We're in Wichita, Kansas. Um, so to go away somewhere, essentially the closest big city, if you will, is, is Kansas City, about uh, two and a half hours away from here. So we frequent it, you know, somewhat. And, uh, of course, what's more romantic than going to the site of a horrific disaster on your anniversary. That's that's just how we roll. What what would be more romantic at all than, than going and, and just you know reliving the the events of of 1981? 81, Is, yes. 81. So there and, and, and in no way am I am I trying to disparage the tragedy of what this is, um, but it was a pretty horrific thing that happened uh, at a hotel in Kansas City, and at the time it was the it was the Hyatt the Hyatt in 1981. Now I believe it is a Sheraton hotel yes. as of last year. Um, but in 1981, essentially what happened, and you can correct me if I'm getting the story wrong, there was uh, it was it's a beautiful hotel downtown. Crown Center area, correct? Crown Center. Um, which is a nice little shopping area, some big hotels, essentially kind of the heart of downtown in Kansas City, uh, of the big downtown, mm -hmm. right? Um, and 81 people are gathered in the lobby of this hotel. There's a dance competition going on, and it's your atypical 1981 high-class hotel with entertainment. And lo and behold... A structural collapse happened within the hotel of the balconies. And there were two walkways, a, yeah. a second floor level and a fourth floor level that overlooked the lobby. Mm -hmm. And essentially what happened was they just pancaked on top of each other right on down into the lobby, killing, uh, what, 100 and... 114 and my God. injured 216. Horrible tragedy at the time was, what, the worst structural collapse or disaster? Yes, it, it remained that until 9-11. Uh, and, and, and with that, just horrific tragedy. I mean, it took investigations. They discovered, I believe it was, it was a structural flaw in some mm -hmm. of the building materials, and, um, and that's, that's what it was. Um, but that being said, that hotel now has been known for years uh, for its paranormal activity, which is not surprising considering what happened within the walls of that hotel. Yeah, yeah. And uh, <laughs> again, this goes back to being somewhat morbid going, hey, let's go stay there for our anniversary and maybe do a ghost show or something. And we looked into it a little bit and they turned out to be fairly booked up for the weekend. So we're not actually going to be staying there. Uh, maybe a good thing, you know, maybe not the best idea for a, uh, an anniversary. To... I don't think I would sleep well. <laughs> you probably would have slept just fine. It took us years of conversating to fi to finally get you to say, okay, yes, we can stay there. Yeah, I was adamant against staying yeah. um, somewhere else. In fact, there was a Westin, or there still is a Westin, mm -hmm. just, you know, across the street. And yeah. I was more than happy to stay there. That was far enough away. Yeah. And then we finally, you finally said, okay, let's stay there. And they're booked, so... No staying there this weekend. But we did go in there a couple years back, um, and we had actually dinner at the uh, the rooftop restaurant that used to be there, and it's no longer a rooftop restaurant. But we took a picture uh, within the hotel walls uh, and right on the balcony. And I don't. I think when we took it, I don't think we were necessarily thinking, hey, let's take a morbid picture or let's take a ghost shot. We were just 
We're on vacation, kind of. Well, if I remember right, that was the first time you and I had gone to Kansas City together. Yeah. And we were going up for dinner, and I told you about what happened there. And yeah. And you took a shot of where the balconies had been, because it's still... It's still visible. It looks like something is just missing. Yeah, it's bizarre how yeah. they remodeled or lack of remodeling is really what it is. Because you can tell where these other walkways were. And it's like it almost looks like they just put a temporary railing up. It really does. Where there should have been a wall. Now that Sheraton's taken over, I can't say that that's how it still looks. But sure. at least when we were there, it looked like that. You, you look there and go, oh, I wonder if it's under construction. And you know, 30 years later. Right. And which is really kind of just bizarre. And there's no markings within the hotel of, uh, you know, commemorating or remembering the event or anything. It's just kind of like brushed under the table, if you will. Hey, nothing. Well, happened and here. if I remember right, we mentioned that to the waiter at the restaurant. We <laughs> yeah. asked if there was any paranormal activity and he had no idea that anything had ever happened no. there. Yeah. Like, what are you talking about? What do you mean? 114 people died in the lobby. Really? Yeah, yeah. It was just very bizarre. But we took the picture in the lobby and oh my gosh, orbs galore. Yeah. I should try and dig that picture up and put that up on the website. Yeah. Because that was a very, I, I guess, you know, somewhat, I don't know want to say disturbing, but it was, you know, eye-opening going, oh my, because it wasn't just like one orb here, one orb there. It was just orbs galore. It looked like someone had been blowing bubbles behind me. Right. I mean, it, it looked like when you take a picture and the light is coming through a window and there's dust in the light, except this was at night. There was yeah. no light coming through the window. Yeah. It was just, they were everywhere. Did you get any weird vibes or feelings at all when we were in that hotel? Oh, yeah. Tour? Yeah. Really? I, I always did. I was fine once we got up to the top to the restaurant. I don't yeah. know why, but there in the lobby, it's just, it had a sad feeling to yeah. me. You know, I'm not a medium, but I, I do tend to have sure. feelings when I'm in a place like that. And I had been there, too, before I knew what had happened. Mm -hmm. And I got that feeling before I really? realized what had happened. Yes. Yeah. And I don't pick up on any of that. That's, I'm just not. I don't think I'm a sensitive person to much. The only time I've ever had an overwhelming feeling of of just sadness and it was probably somewhat psychological too because it was very you're very conscious of what you're walking into was walking through the holocaust museum um in washington dc i mean right but again you know what you're walking into when you walk through the gate of you know auschwitz that's set up in the museum you know what you're doing and you're walking into a train car you know what you're doing i i wonder if i would have that overwhelming feeling had I not know what I was walking into. I don't know. That's an interesting, you know, thought, you know, cause it, it was, it was overwhelming. I was, I, you know, I just kind of started crying walking through there, but again, you know what you're walking into. Right. So if it had just been, Hey, it's a museum. Nobody, they don't tell you what it is. Here's a gate. Here's a train car. And mm -hmm. you don't have any preconceived notion of what this is. You know, you could think it's Thomas the train and you don't, you know, would you know what you're going through? Or I, would would that, I mean, I guess to some people, they would pick up on it immediately. Mm -hmm. To some people, maybe not. I think that would be very hard to distinguish whether or not I was feeling energy or whether or not it was, like you said, an emotional sure. experience. Because it all kind of builds up as you go through that museum. You just kind of, you know what you're going into. It just kind of gets darker and darker and darker and darker. Yeah. And I would say, I think this, you know, the creepiest place I'd ever been to was Ellis Island. We talked about that. Mm -hmm. But I think one of the places where I had the, the most sadness I'd ever felt was when I went back to New York and I actually went to Ground Zero. Mm -hmm. Um, and I know that, you know, thousands and thousands of people have gone there to pay their respects. And I'm sure they all have a level of sadness that they feel when you go there. You can't not feel that. Sure. Um, but I don't know if that was, like you said, if that was an emotional experience or if I was, you know. Had you not known. I mean, exactly. I mean, it, it's kind of you. And there's no way of knowing uh, unless, you know. You had, you had been like the forever young guy and been in a, a tube for, <laughs> for 30 years. Yeah. You wake up, you have no idea 9-11 even happened. What's this? Construction? Oh, okay. You know, because that would be the only way to really kind of know. Speaking of which, that's a topic that I, I'd i like to explore a little bit more with no disrespect to the event. But you got to think, uh, uh, with such a horrific tragedy that happened right there at the, at the, the grounds of Ground Zero, 
that's got to be a place that's haunted. That's got to be a place that is filled with a lot of energy that is just unfinished business galore. You know, and, and it's not necessarily something that I think is a great idea for anyone to go and investigate with a ghost crew or anything like that. But I'm wondering, and I'm, I haven't really ever looked this up. Maybe there is documented cases out there, but are there hauntings that are going on there right now? Well, what I wonder about Ground Zero, you know, the, the finished buildings are so new. Have people even had a chance to be in them long enough to experience anything? Sure. Um, you know, and I don't know that while it was a construction zone, if anything could have been captured happening. or, or yeah. happening or felt, um, you know, and I, and again, like you said, I don't want to be disrespectful. I just don't know how much time has to pass before something starts showing itself up sure. in these new buildings. Well, you would almost think it would be immediate. I mean, if, if, if in fact there is something going on, I don't necessarily think ghosts have a waiting period of, you know, oh, we must wait X amount of time before we start showing ourselves. I'd almost think it would be stronger at the beginning if they have a strong, I don't know. I don't know where it will be equal the whole time. I really have no idea. But I'm wondering if there is any cases of that yet. I would just think that any building that gets built there, although granted the new Freedom Tower, that's, mm -hmm. that, that's what it's called. I believe correct? it is. Um, is not directly over the footprints of the other buildings. It's still on that essential plot of land. Right. Right there. So... I would think of any building that has a likelihood of being plagued by ghosts, that would be the building. I I just don't know. And I think, you know, part of it is with the building being so new and it's still being filled up with people renting, you know, and for a while the construction was still going on. How do you how do you know something unusual is going on or is it just a new building that True. So I think we have to almost wait and see on that. And see what happens and see what sort of documented cases. If anybody has heard of any sort of cases like that, I'd love to share some links, share some stories. You can always write into us at realghoststoriesonline.com. Or we have a fun little phone number you can call and uh, share your real ghost story with us. And uh, that phone number is 855-853-4802, 855 -853 Eight five three forty eight zero two to share your real ghost story, and that may be a topic for a whole show on its own, uh, depending on on what we hear from folks. Uh, again, it's one of those topics where it's kind of touchy because it's meant with absolutely no disrespect, but it is what our show is about. So yeah. you have to wonder, you know, is there activity that goes on there? You would almost think. I mean, and even thinking beyond. Uh, 9-11 before 9-11 i mean there were buildings on those grounds before that have been torn that were torn down to build the original trade towers um there's a lot of energy in that area in general it was one of the earliest parts of the country yes so i mean there's plenty of grounds for you know paranormal things to be going on even beyond uh you know 9-11 so uh, let's go to a phone call we got uh, from uh, 855-853-4802. Hello, you are on the air at Real Ghost Stories Online. Hi, Tony. Uh, my ghost story started yesterday, actually. Um, I live in an apartment with my husband, and we were leaving to go run an errand, and he was walking up the apartment, and I was ahead of him about probably about a uh, couple flights of stairs because we live on the third floor. And in order to get into our apartment, you have to have a key to a separate door. So he was walking up, and I could have sworn he was behind me. So I held the door open for him, not looking back, just assuming it was him. Um, I opened the door, and I held it open, and I just kept walking, and I heard the person behind me say, thank you. Um, there was no other people there um, that I know of. There was no other people in the apartment because it's a brand new apartment and we're one of the first people to move in. So I know that it wasn't a neighbor. Um, kind of just freaked me out because, you know, it wasn't him. I mean, I, I turned around and he wasn't there. So I went back into the building and he had to get something out of the apartment. So it wasn't him at all. So kind of freaked me out a little bit. I'm going to be <laughs> a little bit more careful, but um, this did happen. So thank you. Love the show. Bye. Ghost or unknown neighbor? 
No, I think it's a ghost. And I want to say thank you if this happened yesterday for calling us right away. I yeah. Mean, that's amazing. It's almost kind of, I mean, not necessarily a helpful ghost, but almost kind of in line with the uh, the ghost that you were talking about that your mom had that would open up the cupboards. <laughs> Ferdinand, yes. Yeah, and help out uh, with uh, putting away the groceries. You know, I've wondered, and you may be able to tell me more about this, but I've heard that remodels or new construction or any kind of drastic change to a property can, you know, kind of stir up spirits, you know, and she said it's a brand new apartment. I wonder if that has something to do with it. Yeah, I mean, is it is it a new new apartment, like new construction, I wonder, or is it a, you know, redone apartment, you know, in an existing building or something? Because, yeah, that is very common where you hear of things being renovated from their original form. It stirs things up mm -hmm. for whatever reason. And, and I don't know why that is. I guess if you're comfortable with how things were when you lived there, you probably don't want to see it changed. Yeah, I would imagine If you're still so. living there. Yeah. You know, it's... Well, and I've heard about that, like, with hotels, that when they renovate, you know, and they, especially the very old ones, that mm -hmm. they sometimes have a spike in activity. Is there a lot of deaths in hotels that nobody really hears about, I wonder? You know? I don't know. I'd love to know what the statistics are on that. Because hotels are just seem to me like another one of those places where... I don't know, not necessarily a place I would assume would be very haunted, but there are so many haunted hotels. Mm -hmm. Maybe there are a lot of deaths in them. There was a hotel in, in my hometown, uh, in Fond du Lac, Wisconsin, and there's been, I think I've talked about this before on the show, um, and there's been, uh, I think, a This American Life episode done on it, too, um, called the Retlaw Hotel. And it has, like, every marking of being just bizarre enough things that they did with this hotel for it to be a haunted hotel. It's almost like they don't they don't want to talk about it, but we're going to do everything with this hotel we possibly can to make you go. Is there a ghost here? So, Retlaw uh, is actually Walter, spelled in reverse. The story is that it was Walter Schrader who haunts the hotel. And the story is he died on the, guess what floor? Uh, thirteenth floor. Oh, okay. And he haunts the hotel. And when you look at the elevator, guess what floor is not there? Well, a lot of hotels do that. Sure. A lot of buildings don't have the thirteenth. Sure, sure. But it's not on the elevator. <laughs> but of course, if you go to the actual floor, mm -hmm. which is, I think labeled twelve, or, or I think it's twelve is what it is labeled. Um, it. There is the room and all that, and I don't know how true the story is that he actually died there because he actually had a series of hotels around the state of Wisconsin, all very similar uh, in style, um, and a lot of them have have a haunting story of Walter in it. This one is that he haunts the that floor of the hotel, and weird things happen, and people hear things and see things, and the interior of it is kind of Titanic esque, if mm -hmm. you will, as far as the woodwork and everything goes, but. Um, yeah, haunted hotel, but with the former designer or owner of the hotel. That's my haunted hotel story. I've I used to wander around this hotel looking for ghosts because the radio station I worked at when I was in high school was like two blocks down the road. So when I had a break, I just wandered down to the hotel looking for ghosts and never really saw one. Got locked in the stairwell once, but that was about it. So was it called the Retlaw when he was yes. in charge? It was called the Retlaw when he was in charge. It changed names for about twenty years. Um, it was a Sheraton, a Ramada, a Hilton for a little while. Um, and then only recently, like in the last five years, re was renamed Retlaw mm -hmm. again because nobody ever stopped calling it the Retlaw over that 20 year name change span. See, the first time you told me that, the only thing I could think of was the whole red rum murder spell. Yeah, I mean, thing. <laughs> you, you name the hotel your name in reverse. It's yeah. kind of like, okay, this is a little weird. Um, and there was a theater downtown, also, too, also called the Retlaw. He had a thing about naming things with his name in reverse. That's just kind of, that's different. It is different. And it's, I don't know what it's all about, but it is what it is. So. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go to a uh, letter that was written to us. This was written to us from Bev. Bev writes, a few months after I started dating my boyfriend, I was invited to his dad's for a New Year's Eve party. The street he lives on, he's opposite the city crematorium and graveyard, and as I later found out, used to actually be part of the graveyard itself. It was a normal New Year's Eve. We chatted, joined in with the countdown, and watched the fireworks. We headed off to bed at about 1 a.m. 
my boyfriend's brother and his then girlfriend were sleeping in the spare room while my boyfriend and myself had a makeshift bed in the lounge with the dog. I've always been an early bird, so I was awake a lot earlier than everyone else. It was still pitch black outside. I remember hearing the cluck of the pipes and heating that had just kicked in as I made my way to the bathroom with the dog as an escort, whether I wanted her with me or not. When I made my way back to bed and settled down to try and get some more sleep, the dog lifted her head up and began to tremble as the horrible sound of gasping started up from the front door and making its way towards the lounge. I thought it was my boyfriend trying to scare me, but he was dead asleep. No one else was awake yet, and the floorboards are notoriously creaky upstairs, so I would have heard if anyone had gotten up, and little Holly would have been up, tail wagging and throwing herself at them for attention. It sounded like an elderly man struggling to fill his lungs with air, just a deep, gurgling, thick-sounding gasp. I was terrified. The temperature dropped, and the hairs in my arms and neck rose. Holly yelped and drove and dove under the covers between us. I couldn't bring myself to look at the doorway. I lay there with the covers pulled tightly around me and partially over my head, tears streaming down my face and praying it would just go away. Who or whatever it was now stood in the living room doorway. Anger and resentment pulsed from it like electricity. It lasted for a few minutes before cutting off suddenly. The atmosphere lifted instantly, and the room began to warm up again. Holly had stopped shaking, but didn't budge, and neither did I. I told him what had happened and begged him not to tell his family in case they thought I was crazy. He completely ignored me and told them regardless. They didn't think I was crazy, much to my relief. Apparently, their next-door neighbor had had her house clenched and later exercised after witnessing the spirit of an elderly man face down in her bathtub. She even had a medium come over and try to move him, but he was determined that he wasn't going to be the one to leave. As we were about to drive home later that morning, I saw the neighbor shaking salt in a circle around her house. Now, if we visit, I never go anywhere in the house by myself, not even to the bathroom. I make my boyfriend stand in there with me facing the door, just in case he comes back. That's a creepy one. That is a creepy one. How do you explain that to the in-laws, though? Hey, I'm going to go to the bathroom, but uh, she's going to come with me. She's just going to face the door, though. I, I, <laughs> you know, I would hope that they would be understanding and realize that they live in the creepiest place ever. Yeah, that's <laughs> what's what the question that comes to my mind is if if you are a ghost, are you still gasping for air? You know, that would be horrible if, if you had lung problems later in life and you were had, had a hard time breathing does that still plague you when you're dead see i think it has something to do with the neighbors seeing him face down or seeing a spirit that matched that mm -hmm. face down in the bathtub you know maybe he's gasping for air because he drowned that'd be horrible if you're still gasping for air the whole time as you're a ghost or is that really a I, as I would say, like a human entity ghost, or is that something else that's designed to scare, uh, you know, a human? Because I, I think there's some of that where it's dark and it's not a pleasant scene mm -hmm. someone's seeing that may not necessarily really have ever been a human being. It was some sort of dark entity that's taking on this form or taking on these actions in this form to make you almost trick you into feeling bad for it. That That is a little bit beyond what I would have thought. I mean, I just thought it was maybe just the one that the neighbors saw. Yeah, I mean, that'd be horrible. Yeah. I, I just, that would be horrible to have to be going through, just be reliving what plagued you as in life. I mean, I want to be a ghost. I think that'd be fun, but I don't want to do that. No. If that's what it's kind well, of. Well, go in my sleep. And, yeah. And then haunt our children, you know, and grandchildren. <laughs> to the point of them seeking professional help. That's. Did you ever tell your <laughs> listeners that you put that in our wedding vows that we would haunt? I don't know if I have or not. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. we did in our wedding vows. Since it's our anniversary, you oh. should bring that up. We did uh, in our wedding vows. Um, it was agreed upon that. Uh, what were the What was the exact terminology used? It was. Uh, 
you know, I want to be with you and, and, and until we die and then and, and carry then on haunt. together haunting our family yes. and our loved ones. Something of that nature. Yep. I'm sure we got a few raised eyebrows on that one. <laughs> it's true. Well, that was actually in the vows. And that's what I get for thinking it'd be a good idea for us to write our own vows. <laughs> it was me pledging that we're going to haunt our family. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I guess that's the ultimate compliment that you don't want to get rid of me in death either. So yeah, I think that's a good thing. <laughs> and, and if our children ever take over the show, uh, I'm going to do my darndest to try and show up as some EVPs on here and still do the show in death. That'll be great. That'll be great. <laughs> hey, Maybe- Dad's hosting the show this week. He's dead, but he's coming back. Just kind of listen for welcome. You know what? Uh, go store. Maybe there'll Call be in. a technology by then. You know, you could be like the Michael Jackson hologram and you can come back and do your show. I can actually really just show up and do the show mm-hmm. because they'll have the, the other thing perfected where you can speak through the box. Yeah. And I can literally just kind of have the conversation and come right back. Yeah. It'd be great. I'll sound like, like a robot. I'll sound like Surrey, but I'll still be able to do the show. That'll be okay. It'll, be, it'll all work out. <laughs> All of our listeners will be dead, but (laughs) your kids will love it. It'll be a great show. Trust me. Uh, 855-853-4802. 855-853-4802 is the phone number to call in with your real ghost stories. You got plenty of time in there to leave your ghost story now. I think it's almost up to like seven to ten minutes uh, for you to uh, to tell that story. So feel free to call in and uh, share it in great detail. Or if you just want to write in, go to Real Ghost Stories online. Click on the Tell Us Your Ghost Story button and share away of course please do subscribe as well uh whatever platform you're listening to itunes stitcher or youtube next letter comes to us from b b writes in when i was a small child i was plagued by night terrors my parents fought almost constantly throwing things screaming obscenities typical dysfunctional family stuff and i was their only child so i was often caught in the crosshairs my father worked at night and my mother was terrified to be alone at night so i kept her company from an early age We lived in a small house on the bad side of town, and my mother was terrified of burglars, murderers, rapists breaking into the house and killing us. She was a bit of a drama queen, so if you haven't worked that out yet. To be fair, one of her older cousins that she was particularly fond of was murdered with an axe to the face in the mid-70s, a couple years before I was born, but in a different state. I'm giving you this personal background info because I want to illustrate that my childhood family home has always been filled with emotional turmoil and an excess of negative energy. And from what I have heard or read, this is a perfect environment for paranormal phenomena to occur. I remember seeing dark figures out of the corner of my eyes, hearing footsteps, and generally being terrified to be alone in my own home. Because my mother stayed up nearly all night, she usually slept until 12 or 1 p.m. the next day, leaving three-year-old me to my own devices in the house. Perhaps I grew paranoid, and my little kid mind conjured all of the scary things up in response to this negative neglect because I just did not have the ability to understand what was happening. Perhaps I dreamt up a boogeyman to blame my fear on because I couldn't process the fact that I was living in an abusive home. I'm a bit of a skeptic, but I've had one very life-changing experience. It made me believe there is something spiritual out there. This is my ghost story. Sorry for the lengthy preamble. My family moved out of the little house in the bad area when I was five. My dad bought a slightly larger, one-story home in a much better part of town, close to a good school. I felt better about the home, mostly because it had large windows in the living room that let in ample sunlight, giving the room a warm feeling. My bedroom had large windows as well, and that made me feel great during the daytime. At night, however, I still had night terrors. My mother and father had separate rooms in this house, so instead of having nightly knockout dragout fights, they had weekly knockout dragout fights. Unfortunately, since my mother couldn't rant, rave, and scream at my father, he would go on to his room, put his earplugs in, and lock the door. She would turn her sights on me. One night, when I was about eight, my mother had finished a particularly bad hissy fit, and I cried myself to sleep, and were begging God or whoever was out there to please be with me and let me know I wasn't alone. I couldn't do it anymore. Later that night, I was jolted awake. I don't remember what woke me, but I had this odd feeling that was a mixture of warmth and anxiety. I knew something or someone was watching me, and I was scared that it could be my mother. I glanced out from under my covers, and at the foot of my bed 
Bathed in a glow of my nightlight, a man was standing. He was fairly tall, rather burly and in between muscular and chubby. He had a rather large nose, shoulder-length brown hair that was slicked back, but the thing that struck me the most were his eyes. They weren't any particular color, but they were locked onto mine, and they were absolutely radiating kindness. I felt my covers. I wiggled my toes, and I remember thinking, I'm not dreaming, but this man is not really real. His nose bridge was very pronounced, and his face looked off. There seemed to be a large scar going down his face from his nose bridge down to his lips. I couldn't really place it, but I was drawn to those eyes. His body slowly faded into nothingness, and I noted that he was wearing a button-down pink dress shirt that was unbuttoned a few buttons down with no tie, and he wore a light tan-colored blazer. When he was no longer there, I got up and looked where he was standing. I don't know what I expected to see, but there was nothing out of place, no sign that what I saw was real. From then on, any time I thought I heard footsteps or saw a shadow out of the corner of my eye, I figured it was that man, and I would just tell him out loud to knock it off. I never saw him again. Around the time I was 14, my mom was driving me home from my grandmother's place, and somehow we started talking about ghosts. I told her about the man that I saw in my room when I was about eight, and she laughed and said to stop making up stupid stories. I told her that I wasn't, described him in great detail. She got really quiet. The next day, she took me to her cousin's house and got me to tell her about the man I saw. I gave her the same description, and she got the same look on her face that my mother had. After a few awkward seconds, she started telling me about her cousin, who was also my mother's cousin, who had been murdered in the 1970s. He apparently loved children and was an all-around good guy. The outfit I described was exactly what he had been buried in. He had died from the nasty blow to the face from an axe, so he had a closed casket funeral. His face had been torn apart from the bridge of his nose to his lower jaw. Apparently, I still to this day have never seen a photo of him. Also, I have a family of my own today and don't have contact with my parents much these days. My kids and my significant other are my life and I cherish them every single day. Oh, and as a little side note, when my son was three, I overheard him laughing and chatting to himself in his playroom, and I went to see what he was up to. I asked him what was so funny, and he said that the man with the funny-looking nose was playing hide-and-seek. We were home alone together. Was it just an imaginary friend he'd made up? Maybe. All I can say is that, whatever the case, all of my children are happy and have never had night terrors. That is a wonderful story. That's a good story. That's yeah. a good ghost. That is, it's very, very good. I like that very much. That's the type of ghost you want to have. Mm -hmm. That's that, it. That makes me hopeful, you yeah. know? That you can go on and, and be, have fun. See, and that's what I would do. I'd have fun with the grandkids or great grandkids as a ghost. Mm -hmm. And then I'd screw with my kids. <laughs> yeah. I would just do that. Maybe their significant others more than the actual kids themselves. Mm -hmm. That that's would a, be fun. That would be my fun. I would love that. And that would be the type of ghost that you would want to market as a ghost in a jar. <laughs> yes. We were talking is. about the other day. Yeah. Ghost in a jar. And yeah. if you call right now, you get an extra ghost in the jar absolutely free. Yeah. I could see that. I could see that working out. The phone number to call is 855-853-4802. 855-853-4802. If you have a real ghost story to share with us. Or, of course, you can just write in at Real Ghost Stories Online. It's good to have a, a positive ghost story. A lot of them have been fairly dark yeah well, as of late and i think they all get a bad rap because you know the ones that cause trouble that makes you think ghost is automatically negative but, yeah but it can be a positive you know it can be more of like a guardian type thing and then you have those that start out really nice and friendly and you think are great and they turn out to be demonic spirits that take over your home and your life well let's not go there <laughs> i mean this was really unique because sure. she could understand who this ghost was yeah and at least it, it they could understand who it was, and it had a pattern for years of not doing anything mm -hmm. bad. So right. That's, that's a good one. I think that's without a doubt a good ghost. The next one, uh, the next story comes from uh, Patricia. Patricia writes in, My family moved into the house my parents still reside in around November 1997. Way back in the day. It was <laughs> yeah. charming on the outside, a big four-bedroom house with a pool and huge basement. When I enter the house, I feel immense pressure 
and tragedy. It surprised over the years, it surprised me over the years after I've kind of ignored it. I had a bedroom on the second floor of the house where I shared the floor with my brother, sister, and parents. When I was in my senior year of high school, I moved into a spare bedroom of the basement. I was the youngest of three kids, so it was just me and my parents in the house. My parents would always go out to eat and come home late, so I was usually always alone. My parents' basement had a family room where there was a huge entertainment center, a full-service bar, a storage room, and the laundry room. The storage room was always unnaturally cold and eerie. I never went in there alone. Whenever I went into the basement, I always felt like I was being watched or followed. I had a lock on the door of the bedroom, and I'm so glad it di- I did. I remember walking up the middle of the n- in the middle of the night to my door, and the door handle was jiggling relentlessly, knocking voices in the family room of the basement. When I know there was no one home, I used to have friends spend the night and sleep in the basement, but we slept on the couches. I remember one night we were taking goofy pictures and the one I took of my friend had the storage room in the background at the time I didn't notice it since we were messing around the next morning we went through the photos and that specific picture of my friend we found a silhouette of a man that was completely blacked out he looked to be in the mid five foot range but didn't have a face I freaked out because we both never saw that figure that night A couple of years later, my boyfriend, now fiancé, moved in with my family and me to save money. I didn't tell the occurrences due to him talking it was all fake. I specifically remember one morning he woke up in the early morning telling me to stop crying. I fast asleep and was half asleep when he told me to stop. When he realized it wasn't me, he was frozen with fear. The straw that broke the camel's back was about three years after the crying incident. I was coming out of the shower in a towel walking downstairs to my room in the basement. As I reached the basin of the steps, the power went out. The day was sunny and bright with no wind, no rain, no inclement weather. I turned to find the breaker in the storage room and I heard a long, drawn-out, angry moan. It sounded as though the person was angry at me for being in their territory. I backed out of the storage room and ran straight for my bedroom. Later that day, we told my parents about the occurrence that we had had. They too had had a similar occurrence since we moved in and that they kept from my siblings and I for fear of scaring us. We decided to do some research and my parents were also frightened and a bit curious. We found out that the guy who had owned our house two times before us had committed suicide by shooting himself in the head in the basement. He was found two days later by his wife who was out of town. They never found the motive of the suicide, knowing how much tragedy had gone in the house. I had a strong belief that the cries were of him. I've been wanting to reach out in a seance or an EVP session, but I haven't had the time to do so. To this day, I refuse to go to the basement by myself. There you go. Yeah. That's a dark one. It is a dark one, and it makes me think, you know, that if he was in that dark of a spot in life to take his own life, he's not going to be a happy spirit. Is it more difficult to cross over to a good place when you when you take your own life, I wonder? I would imagine so. Are you still trying to work out those issues until... And then what... How? I mean, that's the ultimate question, is how then do you cross over to another place where you're not perpetually haunting someplace, you know? That I don't know. I don't know. I would imagine that that much turmoil, There's, it's not going to be easy to go over. No. If you have a real ghost story, write into us. Our website, Real Ghost Stories Online. Click on the Tell Us Your Ghost Story button. Or you can call us anytime, 855-853-4802. 855-853-4802. You have plenty of time to share your real ghost story with us. 24 hours a day, 7 days a week on that phone line one more ghost story yeah all right one more ghost story before we wrap up today's episode uh this one uh i have no name on this i just have an email address so i won't uh, it says i love ian so that's that's the i guess ian i'm gonna assume or the person who loves ian is writing in to <laughs> this one uh, says so this took place last year at my friend's house my two friends and i got bored so i suggest you to play with a ouija board 
Okay, here we go. I'm going to say nothing good is going to come of this. No. Of course, my friend didn't have one, so we made one. And taped to the hallway floor outside a room. The hallway has the stairs about two feet away from the board on an angle, so you can't see them. My friend's parents' room was right beside us, and her brother's room was beside her parents' room. The lights were off, and the hallway was gloomy. We asked the board if there was anyone there. The board responded yes. Now, us being kids, we had no idea what the rules of the Ouija board were. So we continued to ask questions that were not supposed to be asked, like, how am I going to die? Do you hate me? And how did you die? These questions could be extremely dangerous to ask. Asking the wrong question could get you an angry ghost and or haunt your house. So, as we were sitting in the dark hallway asking the ghost questions, we started to realize that this ghost was not nice. We would ask if it liked us. It responded with no. After about 20 minutes of this, we all heard a thump, thump, thump on the stairs and a force pushing us all back in different directions. We all screamed bloody murder as I was pushed into my friend's brother's room. She was pushed into her parents' room and my other friend was pushed down the hallway. Before getting dragged into her brother's room, my friend took hold of my wrist and continued screaming. The dragging continued for a good 10 seconds, then everything stopped and it all went silent. We finally had enough power over ourselves to stand up and we tried to make sense of what had just happened. My friend told me the door to my parents' room was shutting her in. And all we heard was thump, thump, thump on the steps. We all got dragged and it wasn't just me. After this, we were dumb enough to continue with the board. Asked why it just did that to us. It was because it didn't like us. My friend now wakes up every morning with cuts and bruises on her back. And that's the end of that story. I believe it. I mean... That's a dark one. That is just a gateway to trouble. And the thing is, the it's interesting when you hear about knocking, um, and this is something I've learned from doing the show, is there's like different, essentially messages within the knocking and the amount of knocks that you get okay. and three knocks is never a good knock to get when you have paranormal things going on mm -hmm. and the thinking is um from what i'm this is not my thinking this is what I've, I've been told is that that is usually a demonic spirit of some sort that's mocking the trinity which is the father son and the holy spirit Okay. And that's what the three knocking is. Mm -hmm. Because there's stories of the of a knock here and there, or two knocks, or one knock, um, without a whole lot of real negative things happening. But almost any time you get the stories of the three knocks in a row, it's usually something not very good that's going to follow that up. So. So how do they go about, you know, whatever they've brought in through the Ouija board, how do they get rid of that? Do they have to have, like, an exorcism performed in the house? Or? Well, I mean... It, that's a good question, and there's really no real answer to that. It's, you know, you can attempt that. You can bring in, uh, you know, church officials to try and exercise the home and, and try and get something out of it. Good luck getting someone there to do that. You know, that's going to be truly qualified to do it. And you can have a priest come and bless the home. Sometimes that helps. Sometimes that stirs things up even more. Mm. Um, it's, it's, it's one of those things where it's like, your best bet is just don't do it. Sure. <laughs> just don't go down that road to begin with. But once you're stuck in it, you know, there's stories of people that get plagued by this stuff, you know, forever. And it's, it's a lot of times the Ouija boards is it's not so much that it ends up plaguing a house. It's that it ends up plaguing a person. Okay. I mean, sometimes it can attach to a house and stay there. But a lot of times with that, it's, it's something that that person will continue to move and go on from thing to thing to thing. And it still follows them. And what's interesting about that is it can also even, it can attach itself to people that had nothing to do with necessarily bringing it in in the first place. And that's what we're hearing right now um, from the, the children who were uh, affected by the Amityville horror. Okay. The, the Lutz children, they're finally now speaking out. And they are saying, and this is their allegations, it's, it's hard to, I guess, have a balanced conversation on this because George Lutz is dead and there's a lot of accusations that are going on with that case of that George was involved in the occult 
and uh, practicing transcendental meditation and calling in other spirits and things of that nature that weren't necessarily good and that that's the kids are saying uh, and alleging that that is what caused all of these things that happened in the house the kids are saying yeah this stuff is true this did happen in our house and it was horrible uh, but George has never spoken up when he was alive to say hey I'm the one who brought this crap in sure in fact he adamantly denied he was ever involved in any of those things but both of the kids or there's several there's I think three or four kids only two are speaking out loud about it um, are saying that hey he brought this stuff in and the kids are saying that these things still plague them to this day okay because that was going to be my question was okay after the the famous house that we all know yeah. from the movie is did anything else happen to them after they fled the family, yes. Um, and it hasn't been super documented yet. Um, George never wrote any of the other books. Kathy never wrote any of the other books. He really talked about it mm -hmm. in great detail. George did an interview before he died and did say that some stuff did continue to follow him. Um, and one of the kids is now uh, writing his own book about it and saying what life was like after as okay. well. The house, though, has had several owners since nothing right. every owner hates the fact that uh, other than the fact they made a massive payday on the house uh, for what the house was bought for and sold for sure I mean you're talking like a 900% profit increase um, other than that it's it's just been plagued by tourists and they've said absolutely nothing has ever happened in the house and so so nothing from the original tragedy no and then nothing from what the Lutz family no experience. Okay. No, nothing. Nothing. Nothing from the DeFeo tragedy to sure. the Lutz. It's all been the house is apparently clean, um, but the family, the kids, are saying this stuff has never left us. And one of the kids actually said that he was practicing some of these the transcendental meditation with George, but he was a little kid, didn't really know what was going on, what mm -hmm. he was doing, but still plagued by it um, to this day. So that's an interesting thing where it will still follow you no matter what, almost no matter what you try to do to get rid of it. So, so yeah. So that's why I said we shouldn't put a Ouija board uh, as a Halloween decoration. Okay. Well, I didn't. I didn't know how dangerous <laughs> they know. were. See, my thing that I've always been terrified of are old mirrors. Yeah. But I thought it would make a neat Halloween decoration to have a Ouija board. But I'm so glad you yeah. educated me before I made that mistake. And in theory, it would be a great Halloween decoration. Yeah, I was thinking, Except for the fact being a portal to hell. Yeah, well, I thought, oh, <laughs> that would make such a cute Halloween wreath with a Ouija board on sure. it. Sure. And didn't we see one, like, somewhere? You know, around Halloween, we saw several, because we go antiquing quite a bit. Yeah. So we saw several at uh, this one antique mall that we like to go to. Someone made a wreath out of one. That was almost exactly what you had yeah, said. Yeah, yeah. And we're like, oh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so glad you you stopped me because I was thinking, oh, how fun would that be? And you know, it, and, and honestly, it's probably not so much the board itself that's that's bringing the, it's using the board, and the fact that it's there. My thought is, I don't want it in the house. I don't. We have no. kids. I don't want the kids to wonder, hey, mom and dad are gone today. Let's play with the Ouija board. You yeah, know? it's like let's just not. Well, and you know what? Our oldest is getting to wear. She's getting to that age where she's going to be doing sleepovers and stuff. We should probably educate her on what can happen if hey. one of her friends decides to bring out something fun. It's funny. It's like, you know, they come in the boxes like from Milton Bradley, I think, is the company that yeah. makes them. They're still like right next to Candyland at Toys R Us. Yeah. You know, I always thought that was so bizarre. It's like Candyland, Operation, Mousetrap, <laughs> Portal to Hell. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Always. Yeah. Anyhow. And there's, I don't know if there's instructions with it or not. I wonder how that works. <laughs> I'm just be curious to open that thing up. Did you ever play with a Ouija board when you no, were No, no. We never had one. And that's why I didn't know how uh, bad they were. Tried once. Yeah. With a cousin of mine uh, in Black River Falls, Wisconsin. And he had one. And uh, it was one of those my mom warned me to. You know, I was, you know, about... About seven or eight. I was like, mm -hmm. do you never play with one? Do you never play with one? Of course, what did I do? Let's go try playing with one. Look, you have one. Let's see what this does. And he laughed at me when I said, let's play with it. It's like, it doesn't do anything. I've tried it. It doesn't work. So we got it out. You know, put the little, uh, the the cursor thing on it. And I just tried asking it some basic questions. And absolutely nothing happened. So I had no luck with it. But not to say that other people haven't, you know. 
My mom has a story when she was a kid that they were playing with it, and they asked it what my uh, my aunt was going to get for uh, for Christmas from her boyfriend. It spelled out ring. Which I suppose little girls could easily move the cat cursor around and spell sure. ring. But that is what she got from a boyfriend for Christmas night or so. <laughs> Take it for what it's worth. Yeah. yeah. There you go. That wraps up this episode of Real Ghost Stories Online. For Jenny Bruski, I'm Tony Bruski. Thank you so much for listening. Mm-hmm.